I want to sort of parse something here that I think is interesting that I know that you know about, but I don't think most people know about, which is like you said, MDMA is it's called, it's marketed, if you will, as an empathogen. It's sort of known for the the pro-social side of things. People like to take it. It feels good. They want to hug people and hang out. You even see the mice wanting to hang out with each other. But does it is it really an empathogen? And and what do we actually know there? Let's start with the human literature. Oh, yeah. So this is there's definitely a lot of argument there, right? Um, about what exactly is MDMA doing? Does it always increase empathy and pro-social behavior? Can we think about it strictly in that way? Um, I would say that there's conflicting research. There's even some research to show that in male humans, it will increase pro-social behavior, but not in females. Um, But without just citing a bunch of literature that's out there that's sort of conflicting, this is what I think. I think that MDMA acts on serotonin and oxytocin and these neuromodulator systems, which um, can have very, very different effects depending on the circumstance, depending on the circumstance that the person is in, including their social psychological and environmental circumstance, depending on the other hormones they've already got cycling, Mm -hmm. depending on their internal state and their mood. Do you know what I'm saying? And so I think that MDMA and a lot of these other psychedelics can, and just sort of influencing these neuromodulator systems depends on the context. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you one example. Um, Oxytocin was that this is the love drug, we're going to fix everything. We're going to give people intranasal oxytocin and it's going to fix all these social deficits. And then there were some clinical studies to show that intranasal oxytocin can actually increase violent behavior. <laughs> um, and, and this is because of the context in which it was given. And so I'll, I'll stop rambling there, but I think the context is really important. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're alluding to the literature on oxytocin where, you know, uh, just to reiterate what you said for listeners, you know, oxytocin is sort of known as the 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 love hormone or the cuddle hormone or whatever, and you do indeed see it correlate um, with those types of behaviors. But as you mentioned, it also uh, can uh, instigate other types of behaviors like violent behaviors. And I believe there's some literature out there that shows that it, it modulates basically things to do with in-group, out-group discrimination. So you might act more pro-social towards those in your perceived in-group, but actually the opposite way against others. Right. No, yes, you're precisely right. And thank you for clarifying that. And that's important, right? Because if we just give this broad uh, neuropeptide, we can't expect it to have a very specific effect. And I think if we go to like across every sort of situation, and I think if we look at the success with MDMA, that's been with psychotherapy uh, in addition, right? And Mm -hmm. I think that textual environment of the psychotherapy, and maybe we talked about this on the podcast, is important for its positive effects. So sort Mm -hmm. of setting that expectation and and properly engaging the environment that you need for the outcome that you want. Mm -hmm. Going back to these expectation ideas. Yeah. And one more uh, wrinkle I want to get into here before I ask you to describe some of the um, results you were involved in uh, not too long ago. Uh, we talked about the potential sex difference here. Um, we're talking about context and, and how important that is. Uh, there's also two uh, MDMA isomers. And sometimes you get a racemic mixture that's given to patients or to subjects. Sometimes you get one isomer or the other. I believe there's at least one or two studies out there showing that some of the you know classic effects, quote unquote, of MDMA are dissociable based on which isomer you're using. One of them might instigate more of the pro-social-like behaviors. The other one might have more stimulant-like behaviors. Is is that your understanding? Is there anything we know about there? Oh, wow. I'm going to say that you surprised me with that. I wasn't actually thinking about the racemic mixtures, but it's, it's definitely a possibility. I'll say some really good evidence. I don't think the evidence is there for MDMA yet, but mm-hmm. I think that the evidence is definitely there for ketamine. This yeah. is absolutely the case for ketamine. And this is sort of a drug that's been used uh, to treat depression. And we know that one of the isomers is much better than the other, right? And so I wouldn't be surprised that we find the same thing to be true for MDMA. Interesting. Um, so you you had a paper come out not too long ago that was really interesting. I took a look at it. Um, yeah. can, you, can you set up the, the basic design here and what you guys were get, trying to get at? 
Yeah, sure. So first I'll say, uh, I sort of told you my involvement in, in actually conducting the experiments of those uh, that was in this paper. Um, and then the first author is Ben Ryan, and he's an amazing uh, science communicator, and he was a postdoc that I co-mentored with Rob Malenka, and then a bunch of other really amazing students and trainees in both of our labs, uh, mine and Rob's lab. So I, I want to say that first. Um, so when I sort of uh, moved on to my faculty position, Ben took over this project and was just really amazing um, and brought like a lot of energy and excitement for the project. And so we started off with that basic set of pilot studies that I had done looking at the 10 minute social interaction with MDMA. And we were wondering, you know, where is this happening in the brain? We know that MDMA releases serotonin, but as we mentioned previously, the anterior cingulate cortex is important for social transfer, uh, but also the nucleus accumbens is important for social transfer. And uh, the main source of serotonin in the brain comes from the dorsal raphe. And we know that the dorsal raphe sends serotonin to both the nucleus accumbens and the anterior cingulate cortex. So mm -hmm. our next question is, which of these regions might be responsible for this increase in empathy-like behavior that we see with MDMA? And so uh, Ben and some others did some really clever experiments looking at brain activation patterns in both the anterior cingulate cortex and the nucleus accumbens following an injection of MDMA during the social transfer of pain. And essentially what they found was that there was this big increase in activity in the MDMA injected bystanders in the nucleus accumbens specifically. And we didn't see that in the anterior cingulate cortex. So that indicated to us that maybe it was serotonin acting in the nucleus accumbens. And that um, in addition to Boris Heitfitz data and Gould Dolan's data, you know, it was pretty convincing that we should look at the nucleus accumbens as a target for this. And so um, then Ben really fully characterized the social the MDMA enhancement of social transfer of pain and analgesia. Um, and he decided to micro inject, which means like to put directly into the nucleus accumbens, a tiny dose of D MDMA to see if it would work. And what that does is it sort of takes out all the other brain regions that might be involved when you give an injection and it goes throughout the entire brain. I see. So if you could just give an animal MDMA, it's getting into the bloodstream, going everywhere in the brain, more or less, um, everywhere that it can go. But in this case, you're going to compare that to putting it in this one brain region and it's going to be limited just to that spot. Exactly. That's exactly it. And suffice it to say that that was sufficient to enhance the social transfer of pain and analgesia. Okay, so this this effect where they they see the other mouse in pain, they display indications of pain themselves. That replicated when you put MDMA just in the nucleus accumbens. Yes, exactly. That's precisely right. And um, uh, I'll also say that MDMA has actions on serotonin. It may influence oxytocin non directly, but we also know it acts on dopamine and mm -hmm. the transporter. So another drug that acts on dopamine is methamphetamine. And so Ben did a really clever control and gave methamphetamine to the animals to see it, if that would similarly enhance the social transfer of pain. And it did not. So that did suggest to us that it's probably not dopamine that's driving this effect in the nucleus accumbens. Um, and it's more likely to be serotonin. So then we started to chase down um, how serotonin might be involved. And by the way, um, sort of interestingly and uninterestingly, everything we found to be true for the social transfer of pain was also true for the social transfer of analgesia. Mm -hmm. So MDMA directly into the nucleus accumbens was also sufficient to enhance the social transfer of analgesia. Okay, so you've got the nucleus accumbens, it seems to be a key brain region here. MDMA, if you put it just in that brain region, you you get it, it does what systemic MDMA does. You get the social transfer of pain and analgesia or pain relief. Um, it seems like it's serotonin going into the nucleus accumbens that's key for this effect. Were you able to show that directly? Yes, exactly. Thank you for setting me up so nicely. And so next, uh, we essentially put um, some ex inhibitory opsins, uh, which it allows us to target specific uh, neurons, and we took the serotonin neurons from the dorsal raphe, which I mentioned, and we shined light to inhibit with uh, this halorodopsin, or no, I'm sorry, excitatory opsins. Rewind. Let me re-explain. <laughs> um, okay. 
So uh, we put channel rhodopsin, which is an excitatory um, optogenetic uh, virus into the dorsal raphe, and we shine light over the nucleus accumbens core. And this essentially just activates all the serotonin release coming from the dorsal raphe into the nucleus accumbens. Um, and we found that this was sufficient to also enhance the social transfer of pain and analgesia. So serotonin all by itself. I see. So you put MDMA into the brain region, it's going to elicit serotonin release and do other things. And you get the social transfer of pain and pain relief. But then if you do a separate experiment where you just directly stimulate serotonin release in the absence of MDMA in this brain region, you get the same effect. Right. And that's fascinating for two reasons. One, because it's only serotonin. We thought maybe oxytocin might be involved or something like that too. And then two, because we were engaging sort of, you know, super, super threshold firing of these neurons, but firing of actual neurons in our brain instead of adding a drug in that doesn't normally exist, right? And so we showed that our normal neural pathway is capable of producing this effect and that it seems to primarily use serotonin. Mm -hmm. And we, we mentioned previously that there, there's some stuff in the literature suggesting that men and males and female humans might respond to MDMA in somewhat different ways. Can you Explain the, the interesting sex difference that you found in this experiment. Yes. Um, okay. So some of, I don't know if all of this is published in this paper because it got very confusing. So uh, I'll get to tell you the T behind the scenes. Okay. So when we started these experiments, Ben, um, I had done it in males and females. Ben uh, started with males and then he did the female experiment and we're talking all the way just the injections systemically of MDMA and it didn't work. It didn't work and he tried it several times and he couldn't get the enhancement of the social transfer of pain or analgesia to work in female mice. And so we're like, well, apparently it doesn't work. Let's just do the experiment in the males and figure out the mechanism. And then we're going to come back to the females and see if we can find out what is different. Um, and so fast forward, he did a lot of these experiments in the females and nothing worked. I think he did MDMA directly into the nucleus accumbens. He did the uh, channel rhodopsin, serotonin release, and, and nothing worked. Hmm. Um, but he and I were chatting uh, because he's as up on the literature as I am. And there's this paper by Jeff Mogul, who did one of the original empathy studies in mice, that shows that the sex of the experimenter can impact uh, the outcome of different pain behavior assays in mice. Um, and so what we did is we had a female experimenter run the study in the lab, because I was no longer in the lab, remember? So I, I didn't run the study. Okay, so the piece that you're saying right now is not published yet. This is not published. Okay, okay. We have no mechanism to explain it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, interesting. Yeah. So this was not in the paper, but it's interesting that you asked about it. Yeah. So uh, spoiler alert, uh, when the female experimenter ran the experiment, it worked. Hmm. So, so you don't see social transfer of pain in female mice injected with MDMA if a male experimenter, a human male experimenter does that experiment, but yeah. it works just like you described earlier, if it's a female experimenter. Yes, that is correct. Um, and the idea behind this, which was put forth by Mogul's group and very nicely shown, was that there are some chemosensory cues, so something about sweat or the way that we smell that the mice detect and respond to. And in male mice and female mice respond differently to cues from male and female human experimenters. And these cues can engage a certain level of HPA axis and like stress, stress response. Basically, is the basic result here that in general, female mice get more stressed out in response when they're around a male human compared to a female human? So that is not what Jeff Mogul found. He found hmm. the opposite to be true that um, ah. male mice would show this big stress response to male experimenters and uh, then they wouldn't show pain behavior. Uh, but they would show it if they had a female experimenter. So this is where it got really confusing. We were like, we don't know what to make of this right now. Mm -hmm. Is that we don't know why the females didn't show this. And it could be, and I'm getting a little bit into the weeds here, but there is this theory that with empathy, um, you have this inverted U-shaped response of activation, stress activation that you need. 
Yep. If you have a very low level of stress, stress activation, watching someone else in pain, maybe you're not going to do anything. It's not going to bother you. And you just go about your day. If you get sort of a moderate level, that might engage a lot of things in you to feel distressed enough to want to go help them to do something. Hmm. If you're too stressed out, like you're too, too overwhelmed. Your own life is in threat, right? You're not going to engage in empathy behavior because it doesn't serve you. Interesting. I, that, 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 that's actually an interesting tie into the imaging studies you talked about earlier with um, the prison inmates. Because my understanding is that um, psych- psychopaths tend to have very low baseline sort of stress and anxiety. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a that's a really good point. It could just be that they don't engage the stress response in the same way when they see somebody else in distress. And that just doesn't drive or they don't even have the ability to get to that threshold that would then drive the empathy like behavior. That's really interesting. Hmm. Anyways, okay, so you, you know this is uh, very much still in the works. You don't know exactly what's going on, but that phenomenological result is is robust. The the, the sex of the mouse matters, and the sex of the human experimenter uh, doing the experiment matters. I mean, yes, a hundred percent. What we need to do more is run. So it got a little complicated too, and this is how science is. Um, that was we ran a lot of these experiments at two institutions. And we were just trying to get the project wrapped up. So we need to try and replicate that basic finding in male and female experimenters at my new institution and make sure it holds up. But one thing is sure that as a male experimenter, Ben only saw effect in male mice. And we figured out the mechanism of that. And he was unable to figure out the mechanism in females. Got it. Yep. So the paper's out is that guy doing those experiments <laughs> on the males. Um, yeah. And you found, okay. And, and just to summarize for people, that result is, MDMA uh, enables mice to do this social transfer of pain and pain relief, male mice at least, um, when a male experimenter is doing it. And that involves serotonin release in the nucleus accumbens, which is this very important in brain region for reward learning, drug addiction, all sorts of stuff like that. 